Welcome everyone. I'm Adriana Ramirez from Connecticut Family Support Network. Today we have our third housing workshop, Housing After High School Outside of DDS. And our special guest today is Walter Glum. He is going to do a presentation on the topic and we're very excited to have him here with us. So thank you, Walter, for coming and uh, giving your time and presenting on this topic to our families and everyone that wants to hear about it. So I'm gonna hand it over to you. Thank you. And uh, I will uh, go straight to my uh, screen share and we'll go from there. Everyone see my screen? Okay. Yes. I have a slightly different uh, title, but same topic. Uh, mm -hmm. Housing for All, a call to action. And again, my name is Walter Glum, and I am the director of the Connecticut Council on Developmental Disabilities. Uh, I am not going to use the uh, slideshow version because I find that when you do slideshow and PowerPoint, it doesn't doesn't go well when you're when you're uh, sharing the just a few quick things about the council and some general comments and then i'll dive into the housing content and stuff uh again and i'm getting a notice that my internet connection is unstable so uh let's just hope that uh things hang out here i'm at my son's house because tonight is uh, open mic at the uh, hidden still up in ellington and as soon as we're done with this we're hopping in the car and we're going up there and he's going to perform uh nice uh, this is not an internet service that I normally use. Let's hope it. it, it <laughs> Fingers crossed. Fingers <laughs> crossed. Okay. So I'm, I'm with the, uh, the, the, the DD Council in Connecticut. Uh, our job here is we're federally funded and we're, our job is to help the state develop a better system of uh, community supports uh, for people with developmental disabilities. And uh, that means we work on all these different things. We fund uh, grants. We've been around for 50 years. We've got a lot of accumulated experience in these areas. Uh, and that's what I'm bringing to this, uh, this presentation tonight. Uh, before we get into the, the details of the housing, there's just a few things I like to share with people that, that we've learned over the years. And they all bear on this topic, but they're, they're kind of higher level uh, thoughts that you, you want to consider as you get into housing or employment or anything else for that matter, okay? So I'm gonna quickly go through these. Uh, the first one, and this is gonna come up in our housing discussion in a few minutes. Uh, when you're looking at a, a service or support for uh, your individual who has uh, the developmental disabilities, the first thing to look at in terms of a model uh, is uh, what do other people do, okay? Because we're all more alike than different. and uh, it's actually a small number of people who use uh, what are called uh, here eligibility spe specific supports, you know, supports that are they're designed specifically and exclusively for the person with disability. Uh, for the most part, you know, our guys, my son included, I mean, we're out there in the community and you need to rely on the same kind of services and supports, housing in this case, you know, as other people. And we're going to come back to this. Uh, this particular chart, by the way, is part of the life course uh, uh, you know, uh, documentation. Well, if you're not familiar with that, you will be. Uh, you know, Connecticut is embracing this for many of its services. Uh, so that's number one. First, consider the all. The second one is before you go diving into looking at services and supports, uh, understand what you want. I mean, how do you want to live your life? What are your goals? You know, and of course, Life Course will help you with this too. Uh, but, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, people's lives get uh you know service driven and that's not how it's supposed to be we want services to support the individual so that means the first thing you want to do is understand you know who you are what your goals are in the case of housing where do you want to live what kind of life do you want to have do you like rural city suburban what do you want to be near you know so forth uh another thing to understand uh you know in groups like this you know we so much of what we and again, I'm a, I'm a parent, right? You know, my son, 34 years old, Down syndrome. Uh, we, you know, we, we, we look to other parents. We look to the experiences of other families to, to inform us on what's going on. Uh, largely because, as most of us have learned, uh, the state isn't always wonderful at communicating what's available, <laughs> what our options are. But when you do that, okay, when, you, when you're looking at what other, other people's situations, understand everybody's different. 
Okay. And what works for another person may not be the same, may not work for you. Uh, you know, people have different income levels, different abilities, different resources, different interests. Uh, and there's really no one size fits all. And this is certainly true in housing. So keep that in mind, you know, when you're comparing, uh, you know, one situation to another. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is that this is always changing. Okay, state services and supports, the nature of the world we're in, it's changing all the time, okay? The services that are available today from the state, whether it's DDS or DEMAS or ADS, whomever, Department of Housing, they're not the same as they were 10 years ago or 20 years ago. So you gotta be careful. You know, there's situations out there that other people have that just aren't available anymore. And there's things coming in the future that don't exist today. So whatever I show you tonight, it's gonna change tomorrow. Right. I mean, the world changed yesterday. Right. <laughs> and we're waiting to see what that means. So, you know, just keep in mind, you know, change is the constant. OK, so now let me dive into the housing stuff. OK, and uh, as Adriana said in the beginning, I'm going to be talking about the non DDS stuff. OK, and I want to put that in perspective with this slide. OK, this is a little Venn diagram uh, showing the relative sizes of populations of individuals with uh, developmental disabilities in Connecticut in different categories, okay? Now, working with the Council on Developmental Disabilities uh, with our federal funding, we use a definition of developmental disability, which is a bit broader than what the state uses, okay? We use a functional definition. I don't have time to dive into it now, but by that definition, which is by the way, restricted to people with severe needs, okay? That's part of, of the, what we're using. Uh, the, Statistics tell us there should be about 46,000 people in Connecticut, adults in Connecticut with developmental disabilities, okay? 46,000, okay? And that's all types of developmental disabilities, but these are all people with severe needs, let's be clear. Uh, DDS only knows about 17,000 in their, their whole system, their whole data system only count, only includes 17,000 people. So the first lesson here is that most people with developmental disabilities in Connecticut are not getting served by DDS, okay? And that's for a number of reasons we're gonna to get to, you know, a little bit later. Within that, it's a much smaller number who actually are living in DDS uh, operated or funded residences, okay? And this, um, when I mean the residence itself is, is a licensed DDS facility, okay? And, a little more about that a little bit later, okay? It's only about 5,000 people there. So even within the DDS system, it's a minority, okay, less than a third who are in those types of, 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 of living arrangements. And, you know, the, the generic, that the popular term for that is a group home, okay? They're actually a variety of things. There's community living arrangements, CLAs, CRSs, CCHs, community companion homes, and so forth. Uh, I believe you're going to have other presentations, you know, about that stuff. I'm not going to talk about that at all. I'm going to talk about the rest of it, okay, which is where most people have to go. I mean, the solutions that most people have to seek because that, that's a small group. I mean, that's <laughs> a, a small portion of this, of this population, okay? And it's not getting any bigger, okay? This is uh, data from DDS on the number of people living in DDS, uh, operated or funded residences, right? so-called group homes, but this also includes Southbury Training School and the regional centers, but also includes all the uh, community companion homes, uh, all the CRSs, all the licensed facilities at DDS, okay? It's about 5,000 people. It's not getting any bigger. This is 10 years of, 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 of data, okay? In fact, it's kind of getting a little bit smaller, not much, but they aren't making more of these things. So if you're not in one, you're not getting into one, uh, you know, until someone else moves out, right? That's how this works, okay? So that's why it's so important for us to talk about alternatives. And that's what I'm gonna talk about tonight, okay? Uh, so by the way, so where is everybody living, right? <laughs> if, you're, if, if you have a, a need and you're not in one of these, you know, 5,000 DDS residences, where are you? Well. We know the answer, right? Most of us on this call, I think, are parents or family members. Uh, most people are living at home. And this is this is national data. It was just published like last month, uh, I think I, I came across this. Uh, most people are living in a family home, 
their parents' home, the siblings' home. Uh, and, you know, few, you can see the breakdown on the left there. This, again, this is a national breakdown, not too different from what we have in Connecticut. Again, it's a small portion. In this example, nationally, 10% are actually in group homes. Okay. And there's a growing portion, and you can see there it's it's 12% in this uh, in this chart uh, that were living in their own home. Okay. And by the way, that's the growing population, and that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Okay. Conclusion here. Okay. Uh, or, or guidance, how do I say it, okay? DDS is not Walmart, right? DDS provides a, is a boutique, really. I mean, they, they offer a very specific set of services and supports that are funded by uh, Medicaid home and community-based waivers. And, you know, you can go and learn all about that on the DDS website. There are some types of residential supports that are provided there, but, you know, it's not your one stop shopping for all the things you're going to need, you know, as a person with a disability, right? So, as I said earlier, most people who live with developmental disabilities in Connecticut are not receiving assistance from DDS. One of the reasons for that is that the eligibility criteria for DDS is very restricted. Okay. DDS will only serve people with an IQ that is more than two standard deviations below the mean. Okay. That's something we do in Connecticut. That's not a national thing. That's in Connecticut statute. You can look it up. It's a law. Okay. Uh, other states don't do it this way. Some do, but most states don't. Most states use a, a definition that's more aligned with what I use at the DD Council, a functional definition of need. Okay. So if you're not getting services from DDS, you know, and you need assistance, and everybody does, I know I do, uh, you know. You're going to get it from somewhere else and there's lots of other parts of the state that provide services and support okay and i give you all the acronyms down there social services mental health and addiction services ch children and families housing labor transportation aging and disability services BESB, brs and oh by the way uh, doc that's department of corrections because sadly when we don't get this right that's where some people land, okay? And there is a disproportionately large number, a large, large number of people uh, in the correction system who have developmental disabilities, right? So that's not where we wanna go, but the others aren't so bad, okay? So we're gonna be talking about, you know, how you take advantage of all these other things. Now, the other thing to appreciate uh, in looking at this, that's not evident when you're in that, five, that group of 5,000 DDS licensed facilities, is that housing and supports, the residential, the residents, the physical facility piece, and then the supports, you know, the people who are there to help you are two completely different things. They are funded differently, okay? They're not, and we, in the past, we have bundled these together into so-called group homes, but that's not the way the funding streams work and that's not the way you build a successful solution, okay? For example, Medicaid, which funds all, almost all DDS services and supports or Medicaid home and community-based services waivers, uh, well, not doesn't pay for housing. It pays for the people who work there and give you the supports, but it doesn't pay the rent, doesn't pay the utilities, doesn't pay for the food, doesn't pay for the, uh, the mortgage or you know, taxes and all that. That all has to come from somewhere else. So these actually financially have always been two separate things but they kind of got mushed together. Uh, and now we're gonna have to unbundle them because you have more options and, and better solutions if you look at these things separately. So what do we do now? Well, there's a new model evolving at DDS and I'm, in a minute we'll generalize this to people who aren't eligible for DDS uh, on, uh, for supportive housing where the individual actually, the way you get your, your, your residential service package is you have relationships with three distinct entities, okay, that are separate parts of the state, separate, ty separate types of funding. Okay, this is very important to understand, especially as we get into what I'm going to finish with, which is the advocacy piece and what to tell your legislator needs to be done. Okay, the first relationship, of course, is with DDS. Okay, if this is assuming you're in DDS. Now, if you're, if you're not in DDS, there'll be somebody else. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Okay.
but you're going to have a relationship with a private provider in the DDS system, and you're going to go to Pratt and get approval for it, for residential supports in the form of what we call individualized home supports or IHS. Okay, that's the budget. That's the Medicaid funding that's going to pay for the people, the staff. It can also pay for assistive technology, by the way, which is an emerging piece that's very important. Uh, but that provides the supports that you need to live uh, for you know your activities of daily living and other things. Okay. Then you're going to have a separate relationship, another one, with probably with your local housing authority. Okay. The person who owns your landlord, the, the person who owns the affordable housing where you're going to live. Because our guys need affordable housing. That's that's by the way, spoiler alert, that's the punchline to this whole presentation. This all comes down to finding affordable housing and then finding a way to you know, get your supports delivered there. Okay, so you have a relationship with the local housing authority. So you have a separate application you have to make to the town, to the housing authority, to qualify for a low income or, or a, a, a affordable housing unit. Okay, uh, assuming there is one. Okay, we're going to come back to that. Okay. And then the third relationship you have is with State Department of Housing to get rental assistance. Because the way, the way affordable housing works is that the housing itself, there's nothing especially inexpensive about that housing. I mean, I mean, there may be some features that are less costly than other types of buildings, but it's a building and you know, it's got, you gotta pay the mortgage and you gotta pay the taxes and you've gotta pay the utilities and everything else. So if you're going to live there, if you're if you don't have a lot of income, which is those that's our guys. I mean, most of our guys, you know, even if they're competitively employed, they're probably in the lower quartile of, of incomes uh, or below the poverty level. Uh, they, uh, you know, we don't want them. We don't want to ask them to pay more than thirty percent of their income. That's the guideline. You know, mortgage companies use it. Uh, the HUD uses it too for affordable housing. So you got to go to the state the State Department of Housing. To get state rental assistance, the, the so called a RAP certificate, the rental assistance program. Okay. So you've got these three separate pieces, okay, that that, that are involved. Uh, and they're all separate relationships. Oh, by the way, now the dotted lines there, what that indicates is that within DDS anyway, and this might work in some other departments, some other areas as well, that the provider of the supports. The, the, the private provider in the DDS system, for example, may package this together for you. So they have, and they've developed a relationship with the local housing authority. They they've have a relationship, you know, where they can get access to RAP certificates, which are probably attached to that, that property. So they package this for you and they present it all to you, but you still have to have separate applications and you have to qualify independently with each of these three. Okay, so now let's talk about these pieces. Again, three parts. There's a personal support piece. There's an affordable housing unit, the actual residence, the place where you're gonna live. And then there's the subsidy, you know, rent subsidy, you know, a, a discount on, 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 on living there. Okay, so personal supports. Well, if you're a DDS, the way they do that, as I said, is the so-called IHS, Individualized Home Supports. That's Medicaid waiver funding, I, not a lot of it. There's a long waiting list. You know, you make a request, you go to the regional, uh, the, the, the RAP, the resource allocation, whatever the P is, uh, you know, in your region, and they decide whether you get that or not, and then off you go, okay? But there's other, sor other sources of that type of support as well, and we're going we're gonna to delve into that a little more in a minute. Uh, for example, at DSS, they have the Money Follows the Person, MFP, and the community first choice CFC programs, which is which anybody can get, and well, anyone who has the need. Okay, that's a needs-based program, also funded by Medicaid, but it's not on the waiver. It's part of the Medicaid state plan, which means it is an entitlement. In other words, if you qualify, they can't turn you down because they don't have enough money. Okay, that's the that's the definition of entitlement. Okay, and then there's some other waivers and supports which I'll talk about in a minute. So there's a number of different places you can go to get these personal supports. If you're eligible for DDS, it would be IHS. Uh, if not, turn to the other ones. Affordable housing units, that is almost exclusively the domain of, of, of your town, your local housing authority. 
make no mistake, this is not something the state does. This is something that's done locally. And we're gonna to get to that. We're gonna talk a little more about that. And then finally, where do you get the, the rent subsidy? Well, the most, pop, the most common place is the rental assistance program, which is also very limited and there's waiting lists and you know the tricks to getting into that. The section eight, if you've had any experience with that, it's, you know, there's a, a lottery for a waiting list for the lottery to get on the waiting list to get Section 8. I mean, it, it's it's a long process. Uh, there's also some ownership assistance programs for people to buy homes. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but just be aware of it. Okay, so let me uh, scroll here. So let's talk about the personal supports. Uh, uh, you've got other personal supports, you've got the DDS uh, waiver for individualized home supports, and I have a link here. And while we're doing this, uh, forgive me, I'm, I'm sharing my screen so you're gonna you get to watch all the all of my doings here. I'm gonna put all of the links that I have on these charts in the chat so that you can get to them. So Bear with me. Whoops, I'm going to have to stop sharing for a moment. Hey, are we back in the PowerPoint? Yes, we are. Okay, so personal supports. You've got a DDS, you have the Home and Community Based Waiver, IHS, and there's a link to that. And that's something if you're in the DDS system, you talk to your case manager about, there's a process. Good luck with that. Uh, I mean, it, it's not impossible, but you know, it's not, there's not a lot to go around. So it, it, they're, they're kind of rationing that. A DSS was community first choice, again, an entitlement. Now the eligibility is different there. So there's no IQ involved, uh, but they really, you know, look at, at your need for what are called uh, supports for activities of daily living. I'm not gonna dwell on that. You can go research it yourself, but it's an alternative that might that might work for you, okay? And then there are a bunch a bunch of others. I have a link there to, to some of the others, but then I have a little more depth on that on my next chart. Uh, this is over at DSS. Uh, there are other waivers, you know, and there's other other funding out there besides that for intellectual disability. So uh, there's a Katie Beckett waiver, which you may be aware of, you know, which is more medically oriented. There's the personal care assistant waiver. There's the acquired brain injury waiver and so forth. So again, all this stuff is on the DSS website. Uh, the link is there and in the chat. But these are these are various ways for you to get personal supports to help you live independently wherever that is, okay? Now the trick is, oh wait, I have one more point to make on this, okay? Besides the personal supports that are available for you, you know, for living in your home, you know, to help you get around, to help you dress, to you know, help you with your, your medical and care needs and so forth, okay? Don't neglect employment and day options, which is a whole different category of services and supports. They're not meant to support you in your home. They're meant to support you out in the community, especially employment. Employment is a great support. I mean, how great is that? They pay you instead of you paying them, right? Right. And I'm talking about real employment, not employment where you have to pay an agency to pay your kid. You know, I'm talking, you know, competitive integrated employment. We have a lot going on in this area. The council has invested heavily in this. DDS is working on it. BRS just got a new federal grant to work more in this area because we, you know, we've, you know, we, state hasn't always done a great job in this area, but they're trying to do better. But employment is a great, safe for most people. It's a great environment during the day, right? You're you're in a place that's supervised. It's probably safe because it's got to com comply with OSHA and all kinds of state regulations. There's supervision, and they pay you. What a deal, right? So think about employment as a part of the mix of, of personal supports. Now, for those who can't work, yes, there are also you know, uh, you know non-work day programs available. But but look at look hard at the employment piece uh, because it's another form. You know, I I look at it as another form of personal support, uh, almost respite, if you will. Okay, and you don't have to pay for it. So affordable housing, okay? So you found your you found your a way to have your individual, you know, get the personal supports they need, you know, for their day and at home and whatever. 
Now you need a place to live. Okay, well, this is a trick. Uh, there's not a lot of affordable housing you know, around. So you're, now you're in the domain of the State Department of Housing, okay, uh, and local. We'll get to that in a second. So, you know, here's the website for, for the State Department of Housing uh, on housing programs. Uh, there's a number of things going on. I'm not, I don't have time tonight to delve into all of these, but just the idea is to open your mind to all these other possibilities. You got to go do your homework. Okay. The landscape does change. Okay. <clears throat> As I said earlier, almost all the so-called affordable housing stock in Connecticut is managed by your local municipality. So it's up to your town. Okay, you, and, and I haven't found a, a centralized directory for this yet. So you have to go to the town housing authority and get to know them and find out how they work and what do they have available, okay? And when you dive into the advocacy and, and you know, get a handle on, well, you know, how come some states have it, some, some towns do, some towns don't, what can we do about it? This is where everyone needs to learn about Connecticut General Statute section 830G. Okay, if you haven't learned about it yet, do your homework. There's a lot of news on this, a lot of reporting on it. But this is a state law that it requires all towns, all towns are required to have an affordable housing plan. And all towns are expected to do their share in having a certain portion of the housing in their, their town be affordable. If they don't, and by the way, most don't, then when a builder comes in and says, I want to build some affordable housing and the local zoning board denies it because they have uh, uh, zoning regulations that are that are stacked against affordable housing and almost all towns do, okay? Then the state can overrule the local zoning board and say, no, you don't have enough affordable housing. You can't deny this. You have to build this stuff. That's what 830G does. It's controversial in some quarters because there's people who don't like the idea of the town overriding a local zoning board. On the other hand, the reason they're doing this is because that town isn't doing its part in providing affordable housing. Okay. Now, every town is supposed to have one of these things, have a plan. Uh, they're all supposed to submit their latest plan on June 1, 2022. Uh, they all knew it was coming. This wasn't a surprise. Uh, most towns did not submit a plan on time. Okay, so here's your homework. Go to your town and find out, did they submit their plan? Ask for a copy and take a look at it. What does it say? Okay, this is the advocacy piece, but understand that the key to developing new affordable housing stock in Connecticut right now lies in the towns. Okay, everything like, like, like special education and so much else that we deal with, it's very local. So. Yeah, there are some state, you, you know, the state can get involved through Section 830G, but for the most part, you know, you're going to have to work with your town. And these DDS uh, packages that, are, that people are that they're putting together with affordable housing now with the IHS services, that's how they're doing it. You know, they're, they're, they're setting up uh, partnerships between DDS providers and the local housing authority uh, who's building affordable housing, if they are. Now, not all towns are. So... 830G, okay? And then there's rental assistance. Now, again, the, the, most of these affordable housing units have rental assistance uh, certificate, RAP certificates attached to them. DDS has made an arrangement with the Department of Housing where a whole bunch of these RAP certificates get attached, get, get given to DDS for their exclusive control so that when you get approved for one of these new housing arrangements with the three pieces, the RAP certificates are there for you. You still have to apply and qualify, but they've been reserved for this purpose. Now, if you know your loved one or you know the person in need of housing has an IQ of 69 or lower and they're eligible for DDS services, well, that's great that DDS has these things, okay? But if it's a different developmental disability with the same need, but an IQ above 69, sorry, those RAP certificates aren't available to you. DDS controls them, okay? So it's something to think about, okay? And it's something to talk to your legislator about and to talk to the Department of Housing about. It's like, hey, how do I get, how do other people get these RAP certificates? Because other people do. 
and they tend to be project based. They tend to be attached to uh, affordable housing development, you know, at a certain town. So it's the, the place, it's the location. And again, the path to that is through your town, through your local housing authority. <coughs> so those are the three pieces. Uh, keep in mind, you know, in as you're doing all this, and, and by the way, you know, some of us, you know, you may have the family resources, the individual with developmental disabilities may actually earn just enough money that you can find a way to do this without the RAP certificate, right? Uh, you may find some affordable housing. I mean, there's stuff out there. I mean, there's there's apartments out there that, that are that, with lower rents, uh, you know, rooms to rent, you know, uh, multifamily homes, you know, houses that are that are renting out sections. I mean, you know, there's all kinds of stuff out there that you can, you know, look it up. I mean, this is Craigslist kind of thing or whatever you all use now. I'm I'm an old old guy, uh, so the you know, as you're going through this. Keep in mind, uh, discrimination is illegal, okay? And unfortunately, there are property owners who don't like to have people with disabilities there, and they, they can't exclude you. So just, you know, if in your travels, you run into a situation where you think an individual is being denied, uh, you know, an opportunity to rent uh, on account of their disability, uh, you can do something about that. And there's three people to call. You can call Disability Rights Connecticut, you can call the Connecticut Commission on Human Rights and Opportunities, or you can call the Connecticut Fair Housing Center. I would recommend you call all three <coughs> because uh, you know housing discrimination is illegal. You can't discriminate on race, gender, disability. Okay, so just you know keep that in mind. Okay, so finally, you know here, here, here's the fun part. Uh, the this can work, except the the capacity of the system just isn't there, you know, for that forty six thousand number that I showed you at the beginning. Okay, we have forty six thousand people in need of this kind of housing, uh, you know, with developmental disabilities, and and, and you know, you got five thousand units or you know people, you know, in the system at DDS. What about the what about the other forty thousand, right? Uh, if you look at the state's work on uh, affordable housing for other the other, the rest of the population, you know they they tend to focus on homelessness and and, and such. The kind of numbers that they're talking about aren't anywhere near what we're talking about here. Okay, so there's a real need for some strong advocacy to get these programs beefed up. We need more affordable housing units. We need more RAP certificates. The service piece needs some more funding too, but at least we've got some, what I call it, decent scaffolding in place to, to deliver those personal assist, the, the personal assistance you need, the service piece, okay? Between the uh, self-directed uh, waiver services at DDS and CFC and some of the other waivers that you have available at DSS, there's, there's support there. I mean, yeah, we could use more. Now, don't get me wrong, but the real bottleneck is on the on the facility side. There aren't enough places to live that people can afford to rent. So, I'm I'm asking you all to get involved, okay? And there, you know, there are advocacy groups you can be a part of, and in the end, it comes down to legislative advocacy. Okay, now that now that uh, yesterday is behind us, we all know who our well, in most cases, we know who our who our state reps are, right, and our and our and our state senators, uh, call them like tomorrow, and you know start the conversation because we need we need help in this area. We we need we need the state needs to do more. Okay, uh, a few good organizations if you want to get involved. Uh, the Arc of Connecticut uh, just got a grant from the Hartford Foundation to do some work in affordable housing for our communities. Super, and then the preeminent organization in the state for affordable housing disability or not is the partnership for strong communities okay look at what they're doing okay look at their legislative agenda because these guys have been working on this for a long time uh, and we you know we need more we need more push you know and then of course this council we you know we're, we're involved in this as well okay so wrapping up okay 
what you know how do you approach this as i said begin with you all take a look at how anybody finds affordable housing okay because that's how most of us are going to get this done there just aren't enough uh specialized if you will uh you know uh, beds available can't think of any other way to say it okay uh before you go looking at the solution understand the problem what do you want where do you want to live what kind of situation you know is, is going to work for the individual okay understand that housing is separate from supports that's critical okay two completely different you've got you need both and and to a large to to some extent they need to be managed separately okay different funding different sources of support different parts of the state government okay no one size fits all uh there's no other way around it. You're going to have to dive in and learn about all this stuff. Okay. Okay. Uh, again, DDS is not Walmart. Your DDS case manager may be a wonderful person and great at helping you get access to the services that DDS has, but most of them are not knowledgeable about the rest of this stuff. Okay. And unfortunately, we don't have any such resource in the state, not that I'm available, aware of, that does true. Uh, wrap around case management that will that will get you through, get you all to, to all the right doors. Yeah, I wish we did. So it's on you. You know, you've got to go exercise all those links that I gave you. Learn about what's available in all these different places within the state government, and and you know, put together the mix that's going to work for you. Okay, uh, understand that this is changing, so you got to keep going back and keep updating yourself on what's going on uh local okay don't overlook your town i mean for housing it's critical right as i said all the affordable housing is mostly controlled by local housing authorities so you've got to work with your town and you'll also find what many people in our world tend to overlook because there's such a strong state level service system is don't forget the social service director in your town even a small town because that person may know you know, a few tricks on where you're going to find uh, the best deal on affordable housing where you are. And it's, you know, Connecticut, it's different in every town. Okay, don't tolerate discrimination, report it, prosecute it, and get involved, get involved with the advocacy. So a few action items for everybody. Uh, the first one, because I, I suspect that a a good number of people on this call uh, have children who are still in school. I'm not sure, but that's often the case when I do these talks. Uh, get the most out of the IEP, especially those transition years. Okay, the more skills your child has, okay, the more, the better they are at taking care of themselves. Okay, the easier this is going to be. Okay, the greater the need for 24/7 care. The diff more difficult it is, you know, that's just, it, it's a sad reality, but there it is. Okay. So, you know, if your child can learn basic safety rules, you know, so they can be home alone for periods of time, that makes a huge difference in how all well this is going to work out. Okay. Then there's the employment piece, right? If they can, if they can work, you've got a big piece of the day taken care of and so forth. And a lot of this gets back to making, putting these as goals and objectives in an IEP. Okay, uh, I recommend a life course tool for looking at you know the 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 trajectory as we say for your child and and there's some nice tools there for looking at all the different parts uh, of 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 a person's life and how you're going to get those covered. Housing being just one of them. Okay, again, familiar yourself, familiarize yourself with the, the resources available from all the different state and private agencies, not just you know, your primary, you know, whether that's DDS or Demus or whatever, okay, you got to look elsewhere. I mean, there's, the stuff is scattered and the only way to find the stuff is to go and, 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 and look it up yourself. Okay. And finally, get your legislators involved. Okay. You know, they, they need to know that you have a need that's not being met if that's the case because they've got the power to add more funding here or there, change some of the rules, you know, to make it, uh, these, these programs more accessible to people. So, and now's the time to do that. Okay, the elections are over. Uh, we have a lot of turnover this year, by the way, in the legislature. We had a lot of people retire. 
uh, a lot of people who were longtime supporters and you know heroes for us in getting these programs in place are, are gone. So there's a lot of folks in the legislature who need to be educated. And the best way to educate them is for you to call them up and go and see them and bring your family member so that they know and do it now. You don't wait till the legislation, <laughs> the session starts. Once they're in session and they're busy with committee meetings and votes and all this stuff going on over at the Capitol, it's much harder to get their attention. Now is the perfect time to call them and introduce yourself, especially if they're new and begin their education on uh, what the need, what your needs are. There we go. This has been very valuable. I know I have learned a lot and I have more knowledge now to even talk to our families about. So hopefully you feel the same and um, just a lot of gratitude for you, Walter, for giving us this information and spending time with us tonight. Everyone says, thank you, thank you, thank you, very helpful.